All right, I had a whole script written and partially filmed about whether or not the Akai Force is worth it in 2023, and then Ableton had to go and release the Push 3, and that means I have a bit of rework ahead of me. However, I am glad that things worked out this way, ultimately because I can give you an actual up-to-date answer, at least as of summer 2023, as to whether the Force is worth it and how it stacks up to its competition now that a new challenger has appeared. The focus of this video is going to be squarely on the Force because that's what I have familiarity with, and I'm going to try to give you some fairly complete but quick context on what it's capable of and what it's like to use it. But if you want the too long, didn't watch straight answer as to what it offers that the push doesn't and whether I think it's worth it, timestamps will be provided below. All that being said, let's jump into it. The Akai Force is basically an Ableton push and an MPC stapled together because Akai made the original Ableton Push 1, and they make the MPC, which the modern MPCs are basically computer brains surrounded by hardware that are more workstation than a groove box. So the Force is basically Akai's attempt to bridge those two worlds, basically become standalone Ableton before Ableton could get to it themselves, and to do so, basically repackage a lot of the software that they had written for the current lineup of standalone NPCs. So the sound engines, like the plugins, the sample manipulation, a lot of that stuff is pretty much identical to the MPC Live, MPC One, MPC X, and so on. But elements of the interface are going to look a lot more familiar to people who know the Ableton ecosystem. Things like the layout of the pads and notes, and the step sequencer, and the clip launching layout. So with that very quick background out of the way, let's get into the details, starting with the sound engines. Now, like I alluded to a second ago, Akai's business model these days seems to be essentially finding new ways to repackage sound engines that they've already made into new incrementally updated hardware and to continue to write new software that you have to pay extra for in order to get existing customers to keep paying them money. The cynical side of my brain, which I think is probably more correct, says this feels like they're just milking their customers. They're trying to innovate as little as possible, sell stuff that is as low overhead as possible, and maximize the amount that they can make from a minimum of effort. To be clear, I actually do think that's essentially what they're trying to do, but the good side of this is that the core software, like the sample manipulation stuff, and to a degree, the plugins are pretty good. So the tools for dealing with and shaping sounds in the force are pretty good. So among other things, you've got your drum programs. with the very finger drummable pads and multiple levels of sound layering and multiple levels of sound shaping, which is quite nice. You've got four effects plugin inserts per pad, plus an overall track set of four plugins and these extra little effects units, which are quite nice. Similar deal with the key group programs, which allow you to basically turn samples into synths. Similar deal here. Key group programs can also be used for multi-sampled instruments, including the built-in auto sampler using the audio input and MIDI out of the force. In this case, I used the auto sampler to multi-sample my Roland JU-06A, available as part of my $5 key group pack, linked in the description. Then we get to the instrument plugins, which there are a couple of types. First of all, there are the stock built-in plugins that come with the device, and they are adequate. Uh, the one I use the most myself is the Hype Synth, and it actually can sound pretty good as the primary synth used in a song. To put it in perspective, that clip that you just heard is from an actual song that I released and I'm pretty proud of. 
and most of the synths on there are the hype synth, and I think it turned out pretty good. But I wouldn't go as far as to buy the paid VST version of it and use it in my DAW. I would reach for a better synth. But hey, for your basic sounds, it's pretty good. It's got a reasonably hands-on way of working, well optimized for this interface. It's Fine. It and most of the other stock plugins are pretty useful, and I'm glad that they're there. That brings us to the paid plugins, though, and this is where longtime Akai device users start to feel a little bit milked. But the thing is, the plugins themselves are actually fine. They're just really overpriced. So my recommendation is if none of them do something that you already really wanted them to be able to do, ignore them. You don't need them. Or maybe if just one or two of them fit something really specific that you really want to be able to do, cherry pick the one or two that you want or wait until they go on sale. I personally find myself using Fabric a good bit. It's got some nice multi-sampled pianos and electric pianos and such built in. Like I said, it's overpriced for what it is, but for stuff like this, I do find it useful. So that's the sound end of things, which is quite competent and important, but probably not the main reason that people are going to be drawn to the force. The main thing about the force that you either are going to really vibe with or not is going to be the user interface. And this is where things I think get a little more interesting. If you've seen the push in action, some of the stuff is about to look very familiar to you. Things like the clip launching or the organization of clips into rows of scenes that you can launch with these side buttons. Or there's the probably recognizable step sequencer complete with the split pad grid layout. So stuff like this. Plus stuff like specific velocities being able to be programmed in in a pretty hands-on way, for instance. A lot of these elements in isolation are pretty intuitive, but because this is Akai, you will encounter your fair share of non-obvious button press combinations, actions that take a couple more steps to perform than that feels like they should, and overall bloat and discontinuity. Every time I come back to the force after a while of having not used it, I feel like I have to relearn major aspects of the workflow. Stuff like hitting shift and clip to get to the instrument editor, or in the mixer, if you want to see the master track, you've got your dedicated little master button down here, and you have to toggle that on and off. Or there are the two rows of bottom buttons that do different things depending on which of these buttons are toggled and how long you press them. Stuff like hitting arm or solo, and you have to remember to like change which one of these are selected, and long pressing these selecting different tracks. The commonality between those examples is that they are not obvious, but once you get them encoded into your muscle memory, they make working with this thing pretty fast and hands-on. Ultimately, the design of this thing is clever, but overwhelming. The previously mentioned clip launching makes iterating ideas, coming up with B sections, and layering super fast, because let's say I can just start a new plugin track, take this little melody and just copy this entire clip over. Maybe I decide I don't want this track, so I can just delete it. All that stuff becomes really fast to work with, and so I find it very quick once I get over the initial hump of relearning elements of this thing to build up a song idea into a bunch of different song sections, organize them into uh, different rows, which are your scenes, and copy and delete and edit stuff. That comes together very quickly and more importantly, funnels you into a very particular song construction workflow using the Arranger. The Arranger was already the biggest selling point of the Force over other comparable products, and now that the Push 3 exists and doesn't have an onboard standalone Arranger, continues to be one of the biggest differentiators. Also, if you skipped to this point from earlier in the video, welcome back, you now legally have to like the video. So yeah, the two biggest things that the Akai Force has over the push are probably the Arranger and cost. Let's very quickly get that out of the way. 
the standalone push as of right now goes for 2000 bucks, and that doesn't even include a full license of Ableton. So that is, to use the technical term, hell expensive. But uh, the force goes for about half that, or potentially less than that if you get one used. So if you've already decided that standalone is non-negotiable for you and you don't need things like MPE, the force just might be better value for money. That's a hard thing to just say as a blanket statement because good instruments don't go bad, but stuff like this, workstations are at the intersection of instrument and consumer tech, and consumer tech can become obsolete or at least supplanted by something that can do more for less money and maybe be a bit of a better user experience. Right now, in summer 2023, if you want the true Ableton experience and all the Ableton tools, you want the MPE, and you have faith that Ableton will continue to support this a long way into the future and give you the features that you want, maybe the Push 3 wins out. Because I have no idea what Akai is going to do in response to this. Maybe they take this as a push to stop resting on their laurels and finally uh, start innovating. Uh, I think that's unlikely. I think they're just going to continue to try to repackage old hardware and software into incrementally better versions, and there's a chance that they abandon the push entirely. When buying tech products, I do always recommend that you pay for what you're getting now, not for what you might get in the future, because you also might not get that unless the manufacturer has like promised that they're going to add such and such update. But of course, uh, the force could become maybe not obsolete, but maybe supplanted as a good option. And I do want to be really aware of that. But right now in early summer 2023, the forces price to a degree, but more importantly, it's tools for creating a full song, including its arranger set it apart from the competition. And that includes the push, which does not have an onboard standalone arrangement view. The force does. So let's do a bit of a dive into that next. The way this process is meant to work starts with having all of your song sections in the form of scenes ready to go. A little intro, build up, and as a part of preparation, set up some custom macros. So by default, I usually like to set my knobs to screen. Then whichever screen I happen to be on, the function of the knobs will change to match what we are looking at. If I change that to say project two, That'll give me the custom macros that I've set up. Holding down menu, if you're lost, we'll get you where you're trying to go. And you can set a bunch of parameters, including their ranges to a single knob. So in this case, for example, I have this knob that I have just labeled the build knob, which will basically cut lows on multiple tracks, a little bit of highs on those same tracks, and bring up the volume of the track that has my riser on it. So check this out. So you can get that stuff set up in advance and we've got all of the building blocks of our song. Then we can go to the arranger view. In this case, this is what a song looks like once you've already done the arrangement. Essentially, you're going to be launching your clips and your scenes and uh, turning your macros in order to build up your song arrangement live on the fly. I'm going to link a video at the end of this one where I just do that for a full song on camera so you can see and hear what that looks like. You'll be recording these knobs automation as well, by the way. Then if I set this back to a range, I can go into the grid for say this drum track and I've got all of the MIDI notes in here, which is a bit much, but that means that you can get really specific about minute changes over the course of the song, or you can do stuff like tweak the automation. So if you've got automation that needs to happen over the course of your song and you want to dial it in further after the fact, if you say didn't like play it in properly, you also are able to do that. Then once you've got this full arrangement dialed in the way you like it, you can either just export this entire song as a WAV file onto your SD card, or if you're me, you can export all of the stems of this and bring it into your DAW of choice for a final mix and master. And if you filmed the recording of that performance, which I do recommend you do, you end up with a nice little music video or music visualizer after the fact, but you can still go back and tweak the music as much or as little as you want 
afterwards. That kind of live in-studio approach, though, is very specific, and whether or not you vibe with that is going to be a big part of whether or not this is worth it for you. And you might be asking, why not live in general? Why specify live in studio? And I've spent a lot of time thinking about this because, okay, realistically, a club audience, say, or a concert audience, is not really going to care that I'm doing all of this impressive uh clip launching and knob twisting. So that's kind of high risk, low reward, because I think a mess up on the force is not the easiest to recover from live. Plus, if I am in a club or concert setting, I'm probably playing back to back with people. So I'm probably realistically going to just finally teach myself to DJ on the equipment that they're using, because that's how that's going to work. Or if it's a more kind of chill show, maybe in like a cafe or something, I might opt for something like the Innovation Circuit Tracks and a couple of outboard hardware synths because that feels a bit more forgiving for jamming with. The Force is just a bit of a beast to try to wrangle, and I would prefer to do that in a studio setting where I can do another take if I need to. Plus, Note that there's no way to like switch between projects while the music is playing. So realistically, you're probably going to be cramming your entire set into one project, which would be fine if you figured that you could do that without hitting the RAM limitations, which you very well might. So you'll probably end up bouncing some stuff down to audio or loading in stems from your DAW. This is fine, except for the fact that that does remove some flexibility. God help you if you want to do any tempo changes. And it means that you're going to run up against the audio track limit because it's hard capped at eight. The plugin instrument number is also hard capped at eight. By the way, I tested both of these just to make sure that that's still a thing. It is. You can work with that, you can work within that, but it's definitely going to require you to accept more limitations than I feel like one should have to accept for something that is this relatively expensive as far as workstations go. I should also mention on the note of DJing, I did do a little mini DJ set on The Force, which I'll link at the end of this video, that's on my second channel. That's fun because we've got the crossfader, you can set up macros with your own filter sweep settings, but there's not going to be any spontaneity. You've got to pretty much have all of your clips ready to go from the get-go. And once again, tempo changes are a problem. This is just not set up to do that. And so for the little set that you can see in that video, no tempo changes to be had. Everything's 150 BPM, period. What I'm getting at here is that the force is very impressive, especially as it's been updated over time. It used to be kind of a dud and now it's very capable. And I would even say it's still relevant. I don't think the push has eaten its lunch just yet. That could absolutely change, to be very clear. But as of right now, I think the force still has some relevancy, but it's a narrow relevancy. It's got a niche use case for a niche audience who not only has the desire to engage with the very specific clips to full song pipeline that the device funnels you into, but also have the disposable income to spend on something that's kind of overkill for some things and underkill for others. I personally happen to be one of the like 20 people who really clicks with the force workflow and can vibe with the sound enough to make it work. But I think that audience is pretty small. Although to be fair, if I was to splurge on an Akai device, I'll take the force over the MPC XSE any day of the week. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to see that full song jam, you can check out this video up over here. If you'd like to see that DJ set, you can check out this video over here. And if you'd like to see a more in-depth look at using the force for live performance, I've got you covered down over here with a more detailed walkthrough. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll be back with a new video in a little bit.